Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. Radar signals originating in Iran have been heard on the 10-meter band. Canadian radio amateurs petition Parliament to end deliberate interference. The Reverse Beacon Network is testing a separate spot stream for FT8. CAMSAT offers more details on its new satellites, one of which is carrying HF transponders. The FCC denies an amateur's petition to prevent interference from digital repeaters to analog repeaters. Mars is urging its members to only use computers that are air-gapped from the Internet. The FCC proposes a $2.8 million fine against Hobby King for non-compliant drone transmitters. And an article in Politico raises the visibility of the Amateur Radio Parity Act's progress and challenges in Congress. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to talk about cybercrime. Australia's own Anno Benchop, VK6FLAB, will be telling us about logging of a different kind. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with a long-lost ancient amateur archive as he takes a look at another one of amateur radio's fallen flags. This week, a look at helicrafters. And we will have the conclusion of the AMSAT Forum held at this year's Hamvention in Xenia, Ohio. We will hear from Joe Spire, K6WAO, president of AMSAT, and from Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, who heads up the ARIS team at AMSAT. That's all straight ahead as edition number 1007 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in hot, hazy, and humid Albany, New York, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from the western Catskills, where our corn patch has survived the tornadic winds of earlier this week, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our news bureau in the heart of central New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF in Syracuse, New York. Reporting from our news bureau in Death Valley, uh, no, Fayetteville, Arkansas, where it seems as hot as Death Valley, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, approaching well done. Reporting live from the k 9 ig News Bureau, where it's sunny and beautiful, this is Amy Jo Clark. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. While 10 meters has not been the hottest band in amateur radio's toolkit of late, Iran apparently has found it an ideal spot to operate various radars. For more details on this late-breaking story, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from ARRL headquarters in Newington. The interference was audible in International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 and perhaps elsewhere in the world. Quote, Iranian radars were very active on our 10-meter band every day, reported IARU Monitoring System Coordinator for Region 1, Wolf Hadel, DK2OM. On 28.860 MHz, we could daily receive the strong and long-lasting signals. Other frequencies were used in frequency hopping mode, unquote. The list of additional amateur radio intruders on 10 meters included, or in some cases no longer included, some of the usual suspects. Hadel reported that FM signals from Russian taxi dispatchers, driftnet fishery buoys, and citizens band users in Brazil have been operating on various 10 meter frequencies. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. Meanwhile, some chronic intruding signals have disappeared. Among the missing is the 14.295 harmonic from Radio Tajik on 4.765 kHz, Radio Harjasaya in Somaliland on 7,120 kHz is said to have been off the air for several weeks due to a transmitter failure. We did not miss the transmissions, quipped Hadel, who also expressed the hope that the broadcast battle between Radio Eritrea and Radio Ethiopia on 40 meters may now be at an end. 
For some time now, Radio Eritrea contended with Ethiopian white noise interference on 7,140 and 7,180 kilohertz. This month, Ethiopia announced it would accept a peace deal with Eritrea to end the bloody 20-year-old dispute. Hadel reported a hybrid modem signal for a few days in May on 14.000 megahertz from the Israeli Navy, consisting of six precarriers of PSK-4 Parallel and MIL-188 110A Modified. Just below 20 meters on 13.998, the transmissions of FSK-16 from Russia were observed on May 31st. The signal was heard up to 14.0165 MHz in the amateur band. Radio amateurs in Canada, primarily in the province of Quebec, have mounted a petition drive demanding that members of the House of Commons prompt decisive regulatory action against a Quebec resident who has been causing deliberate interference. The petition does not spell out the particulars of the allegations, but says the alleged offender, apparently unlicensed, is already known to authorities. Petitioners claim that the individual's malicious intentions have been threatening the security of emergency radio communication in the province, and they called upon parliamentary lawmakers to ensure the security of HF radio communication. For two years, a Nicolette resident near Trois-Rivières in Quebec illegally set up a transmitting radio station and is generating interference on purpose, the petition recounts. Amateur radio operators in Quebec have identified the illegal radio station and brought it to the attention of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, or ICED Canada, and its inspector sees the individual's radio equipment. One of ICED's functions is telecommunications regulation. According to the petition, the alleged offender acquired new equipment right away and returned to jamming the airwaves. The petition identifies the alleged offender as a male who is known to police in Nicolette and Trois Rivières and has regular encounters with the law. We are calling on the government to provide more support to the Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada so that it can intervene more decisively in this matter, the petition declared. Radio Amateurs of Canada, the country's national amateur radio organization, was noncommittal. While we have not had a chance to investigate the specific details of the incidents that the petition refers to, we agree with the importance of acting to support the security of high-frequency communications, RAC said this week. As of June 12th, the online petition had gathered more than 625 signatures, primarily from Quebec and Ontario. Canada has more than 50,000 amateur radio licensees. The Amateur Radio on the International Space Station Ham Video Digital Amateur Radio TV Transmitter on the International Space Station is reported to be defective with onboard repair not possible. Also known as Ham TV, the DATV system stopped working in mid-April and a subsequent test on June 1st using a second LS band patch antenna on the Columbus module had failed. ARISS EU mentor Gaston Bertels, ON4WF, said ARISS plans to return the transmitter to Earth to repair, pending space agency approvals and availability of ARISS funds. Schools and crew members performing educational ARISS school contacts are delighted to use ham video, Bertels said. We will do the best we can to restart this service as soon as possible. Following extensive testing, the HAM TV system was first used for an ARISS school contact in February 2016. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. In the wake of an investigation resulting from a 2017 ARRL complaint, the FCC has proposed fining Hobby King and associated entities $2.8 million for apparently marketing non-compliant RF devices and failing to comply with commission orders. With more on this story, we go to League Headquarters, where Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, is standing by with this special report. 
The proposed penalty comes in the wake of a 2017 ARRL complaint. According to a June 5th FCC Notice of Apparent Liability, Hobby King appears to have sold non-compliant audio-video transmitters intended for use with unmanned aircraft, such as drones, and in some instances marketing them as amateur radio equipment. The FCC stated, quote, The Enforcement Bureau previously issued a citation notifying Hobby King of its legal and regulatory obligations and ordering it to cease and desist from marketing non-compliant equipment. Additionally, the Bureau issued a citation against Hobby King for failing to fully respond to a letter of inquiry. Despite these citations, Hobby King has continued its apparently unlawful practices, unquote. Hobby King had denied that it was marketing its drone transmitters to U.S. customers, but in its January 2017 complaint, ARRL pointed out that a member was able to purchase a drone transmitter from Hobby King and have it shipped to a U.S. address. In his letter to the FCC Spectrum Enforcement Division, ARRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, described the transmitters as being blatantly illegal at multiple levels and noted that they used frequencies intended for navigational aids, air traffic control radar, air route surveillance radars, and global positioning systems, and not only amateur radio frequencies as the marketer had purported. ARRL lab staffers Mike Ruber, W1MG, and Bob Allison, WB1GCM, and lab manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, bought and tested some of the units, confirming the cited issues. In a related news release, the FCC said that while Hobby King represented that its transmitters operated in designated amateur radio bands, the Commission's investigation uncovered that 65 models could also apparently operate outside of the ham bands. The FCC noted that amateur radio equipment used to telecommand model craft are limited to 1 watt, but three transmitters operated at significantly higher power levels of 1.5 and 2 watts. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. ARRL told the Enforcement Bureau in 2017 that the devices represent a real and dangerous threat to the safety of flight, especially when operated from a drone platform that can be hundreds of feet in the air. The FCC noted that amateur radio equipment used to telecommand model craft are limited to one watt, but three transmitters included in the NAL apparently operated at significantly higher power levels of 1.5 watts and 2 watts. The Commission generally has not required amateur equipment to be certified, but such equipment must be designed to operate only in frequency bands allocated for amateur use, the NAL said. If such equipment can be operated in amateur and non-amateur frequencies, it must be certified prior to marketing and operation. The FCC also said in its NAL that consumers who own such Hobby King devices should cease using them immediately or risk enforcement action. The FCC this week has also issued an enforcement advisory cautioning that drone transmitters must comply with FCC rules in order to be marketed to customers in the U.S. and that operators must comply with FCC rules. However, many AV transmitters that purport to operate on amateur frequencies also operate on frequencies that extend beyond the designated amateur frequency bands, the advisory said. If an AV transmitter is capable of operating outside of the amateur frequency bands, it cannot be advertised, sold, or operated within the United States without an FCC equipment certification. Individuals without an amateur license may not use such radio equipment if it is designed solely for use by amateur licensees. Imlay said that the FCC action addressed another of many instances in which unscrupulous importers import and market products in the U.S. touted as amateur radio equipment but actually marketed to the general public and which, in this case, have a high potential for abuse and interference to other radio services and to radio amateurs. Imlay characterized the FCC NAL as an important line in the sand aimed at keeping companies from encouraging the general public to use the amateur bands without a license. 
U.S. Army Military Auxiliary Radio System, or MARS headquarters, is recommending that MARS members migrate to standalone computer systems for MARS radio operations, subject to availability of a dedicated computer. These computer systems, or their associated local area networks, should be air-gapped from the Internet, Army MARS Headquarter Operations Officer David McGinnis, K7UXO, said in a message to members. Although not a requirement for membership at this time, we will continue to make this a condition of certain parts of our exercises. McGinnis pointed to remarks by Cisco researchers in a recent Ars Technica article about VPN filter malware. Hackers possibly working for an advanced nation have infected more than 500,000 home and small office routers around the world with malware that could be used to collect communications, launch attacks on others, and permanently destroy the devices with a single command. McGinnis told Army Mars members that Mars headquarters does not discuss specific cyber threats with Mars members or with the public. We also cannot confirm or deny information about specific threats, he said, adding that he had no specific knowledge about VPN filter malware and no comment on the Cisco report. For communication exercises this year, Mars established conditions for a certain portion of the drill that required use of standalone computer systems normally not connected to the Internet. Mars member and software consultant Steve Hadusik, N2CKH, has recommended that members using the MIL STD data modem terminal communication software employ standalone computers in conjunction with the software as a best practice for achieving a high level of performance. McGinnis also said discussion of standalone computer systems on Hadusik's support forums and their use of communications exercises let Army Mars headquarters weigh in on the discussion. He pointed out, that the Mars mission assumes that an internet connection is not available. He said used or refurbished PCs are widely available at low cost and could be dedicated to serve a standalone function. The most effective way to protect against threats that come from the internet is to isolate from the internet, McGinnis added. Despite a standalone environment, we assume that all computer systems in private citizens' hands are infected with hostile software code of some sort and are not secured, he said. No amount of virus and malware scanning software changes that assumption. We can, however, isolate computers by disconnecting them from the international network in which hostile software will report and receive instruction. McGinnis said future versions of Mars software will check for an internet connection and will disable the software. We understand this lockout does not provide security in and of itself. Rather, its value is in changing the behavior of members, he explained. He encouraged Mars to monitor for internet security threats and determine how to secure their internet-connected and standalone devices. Mars program manager Paul English, WD8DBY, told ARRL that the Mars goal is to isolate Mars members' computers from the internet as much as possible. Having standalone computers running as few other resources than Mars-related software improves the overall MIL STD system software performance and further isolates computers from infections, malware, and hacking, he said. English added that isolating the computers that members use for Mars-related activity is a goal but has not been directed. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The FCC has turned away a petition for rulemaking from a Michigan radio amateur that asked the commission to amend section 97.205 of the Amateur Radio Service rules to ensure that repeaters using digital communication protocols do not interfere with analog repeaters. Charles P. Adkins, K8CPA of Lincoln Park, had specifically requested that discrete analog and digital repeaters be separated either by distance or frequency and that digital repeaters be limited to 10 watts output. The FCC recounted in its June 1st denial letter released over the signature of Scott Stone the Deputy Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau Mobility Division. According to the letter, Adkins had characterized digital repeaters as a major annoyance to analog repeater operators. In 2008, we rejected a suggestion to amend Section 97.205 Subpart B to designate separate spectrum for digital repeaters in order to segregate digital and analog communications, the FCC said in its letter to Adkins. We noted that when the Commission has previously addressed the issue of interference between amateur stations engaging in different operating activities, it has declined to revise the rules to limit a frequency segment to one emission type in order to prevent interference 
interference to the operating activities of other amateur radio service licensees. The FCC told Adkins that current Part 97 rules already address the subject of interference between amateur stations, prohibiting, among other things, willful or malicious interference to any radio communication or signal, and spelling out how interference disputes between repeaters should be handled. You have not demonstrated any changed circumstances or other reason that would warrant revisiting this decision, the FCC concluded. Consequently, we dismiss your petition. The FCC did not assign a rulemaking petition number to Adkins Petition, nor invite public comments. As a beta test, the popular reverse beacon network, or RBN, has announced it's now offering a separate Telnet feed for FD8 spots at telnet.reversebeacon.net, port 7001. In addition to the current spot feed, same address, except on port 7000 which will be repurposed to handle only CW and RTTY spots. For more details on the story, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX, reporting from ARRL headquarters. As a beta test, the popular Reverse Beacon Network has announced that it's now offering a separate Telnet feed for FT8 spots at telnet.reversebeacon.net colon 7001 in addition to the current spot feed which will be repurposed to handle only CW and RTTY spots. In addition, a beta version of aggregator version 5 that can handle FT8 spots received from WSJTX will be available on the RBN website with instructions on how RBN node operators can configure their nodes to spot FT8 call signals on one or more bands. The most striking characteristic of FT8 spots is their sheer quantity, the RBN announcement said, citing weekday statistics from May 23rd and 24th, when FT8 spots represented 86% and 87% of all spots, respectively, while CW spots were 13% and 14%, respectively, and RTTY spots were below 1%. Throughput on both days totaled some 30,000 spots. The RBN team said it wanted to find out whether RBN servers would be up to the task before the fall contest season. The beta test follows a limited alpha test aimed at getting a feel for the spot load and other implications of carrying FT8 spots on the RBN, whether due to the starting league popularity of the new mode or the ability to spot stations at 22 dB below the noise level. It seems obvious that adding FT8 spots to our spot flow could have a huge impact on the infrastructure of the RBN, the RBM announcement said. These numbers suggest that if only 20 to 30 RBM nodes added FT8 spots, those spots could outnumber the total CW and RTTY spots being delivered by the 140 to 150 nodes currently active on the network, doubling the total required throughput. Operators of retail DX clusters are encouraged to offer the option of RBN spots with and without the FT8 spots, as they now often give users a choice between spot streams with and without skimmer spots, and to advertise when they begin to carry FT8 spots, the announcement said. We will closely monitor how the RBM servers handle the new load, as more and more nodes begin sending FT8 spots, the announcement concluded, adding the RBN reserves the right to make any necessary steps to protect the core mission of the RBN, including shutting off the FT8 stream on major CW and RTTY contest weekends, or discontinuing the FT8 spotting altogether. Even then, PSK Reporter would continue to carry FT8 spots, the announcement pointed out. We hope we're not doing this in a vacuum, the RBN team said, noting that it's been collecting the views of contesters and DXers and think that we're heading in the right direction. The RBN team consists of KM3T, N4ZR, PY1NB, SV3SJ, and W3OA. Organizers of Ham Radio 2018, held June 1st through the 3rd in Friedrichshafen, Germany, report that attendance at this year's show was down slightly from 2017. The official count of radio amateurs, scouts, and Maker Fair attendees was 15,460. That's down by 1,650 from last year. Ham Radio has confirmed its position as the leading amateur radio exhibition, organizers said. It once again proved to be the mecca for amateur radio operators from around the world, the place where the ham spirit is alive. Radio Scouting, the Adventure of Youth Amateur Radio was the theme for the 43rd edition of the International Amateur Radio Exhibition. Deutscher Amateur Radio Club Chair Stefan Schoep, DL7ATE, said Friedrichshafen is a social occasion and the emphasis on scouting was a plus. 
For years we have been talking about how the scouts could really present themselves on a big scale here, and this year it actually happened. Visitors were very interested in this topic, especially the young ones, he said. DARC is a ham radio sponsor. One commercial exhibitor reported that, despite fewer visitors, their new products sold out on the first day of the three-day event. ARRL fielded a contingent of representatives to Ham Radio 2018, headed by President Rick Roderick, K5UR. Show organizers conceded that the date for this year's show was not ideal because of conflicting events, and the drop in attendance was not unexpected. Next year, Ham Radio will return to its traditional late June position on the calendar. It will take place June 21st to the 23rd in 2019. The ARRL Tapper Digital Communications Conference seeks technical papers for presentation at the conference held September 14th and 16th in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and for publication in the conference proceedings published by ARRL. Conference presentation is not required for publication. Papers are due by July 31st to Maddie Weinberg, KB1, EIB, ARRL, 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut, 06111, or via email. The ARRL Tapper DCC is an international forum for radio amateurs to meet, publish their work, and present new ideas and techniques. Topics include, but are not limited to, software-defined radio, digital voice systems, digital satellite communications, precision timing, digital signal processing, APRS, spread spectrum, networking over amateur radio, wireless networking protocols, and topics that advance the amateur radio art. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakaba, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Come on, take a free ride on the tech train. So I... Yeah. We are just under attack. Let's face it. We are under attack. The internet, you know, when I first got on the internet, and I remember this experience vividly still to this day, 1994. And it was a text-based internet at the time. It wasn't, browsers weren't common yet. That's just right about when uh, Mosaic came out and all of that. Maybe it was even 93. But I remember getting on a text-based internet connection way back when, in the early days of the internet, and thinking, whoa, whoa. A, this is this whole world full of pilot, populated with all these people doing all these interesting things. There's all, so much going on here. It's as if you discovered a hidden city in your basement. It was, it was a, just mind-bending. And then the next reaction I had, this is going to change everything, which was true. Uh, I didn't understand quite how it was going to change everything, but uh, at least I could tell this was a big deal. And I was hopeful about, uh, about it becoming a democratic institution. It would give everybody a voice, would let everybody, you know, and we've seen a lot of that. For instance, um, it's changed the way we buy things. Nowadays, you can't make a bad product for very long because we all talk to one another on the internet. And if a product's bad, internet aware consumers will know it right away. So it's really, it's, it's improved, uh, you, know, inf you know, the free flow of information in that respect has really improved life. What I didn't, what I misunderstood or I guess didn't give enough weight to is the fact that, and I knew this, that there's a certain percentage of people that are just awful people in the world. It's, it's, I believe, a small percentage because I'm a wide-eyed optimist. I think most people are good and kind and generous. We're all capable of being jerks from time to time. And then there's some people who'd make it a full-time job. And what I didn't really understand is that in the same way that we would all get a voice, they would get a voice too. And if you're really a jerk, you, uh, you can use the leverage of the internet 
to amplify your impact on others dramatically. So just as it amplifies your impact for the good, it can amplify your impact for the bad. And I really underestimated how how much people would take advantage of this. Bad guys creating malware. At first, you know, it was just vandalism. It was just teenagers just kind of acting stupid. I, I defaced your website. <laughs> but it quickly became a money-making uh, scam. You know, we started getting the scam emails and then ransomware and uh, you know it really got out of hand and it is getting more out of hand all the time then then you know cyber criminality expanded to, to nation states and we started to see cyber attacks you know countries i mean in the past if a country let's say you know somebody like vladimir putin at russia wanted to impact the american election there really wouldn't be much he could do well that's changed hasn't it that's changed you also see now evil geniuses, some of them not so genius, taking advantage of the Internet of Things. We have a lot of devices online now. Used to be, you know, you might have one computer online through a modem, right? <laughs> that was all you could do. Now, if you do a little inventory of your home, you might find many devices online, not just your computers, but your phones, your tablets, your picture frames, your televisions, your microwave ovens, your dishwashers, your washing machines, your doorbells, your thermostats, cameras everywhere. You know, the average home probably has a dozen devices online, maybe more. And some of those devices are not well designed in terms of security. They're hackable, very easily hackable. And we're starting to see the impact of that. We so Experts have been warning about this for years. But we're now. But it took a little while. It takes a little while for the bad guys. And you know, this funny thing is, we were, I'm talking about, uh, of course, a week ago, the internet was brought down by uh, an attack that used cameras and internet routers that weren't properly secured, couldn't be, in fact, properly secured, to take down um, a big chunk of the internet. And now we're learning that we think it might not have been ex expert hackers or even governmental hackers, but what they call script kitties hackers that didn't really know what they were doing but the tools are out there and so easy to use that they could and that's really scary because you can think of a kind of a you know a kid that is basically a sociopath as has no really regard or understanding of how other people feel or what the what the world is even like a kid who's been kind of sheltered maybe played video games most of his life never really got to know other people and this kid now has the tools to do things like bring the internet down and that's the situation we're in right now so we have bad actors using our tools on the internet to take over your computer for blackmail purposes with ransomware we have state actors using computers hacking computers for political uh, purposes as well as a new form of warfare by the way, we do this too. I'm not saying it's it's just them. It's us too. We do it, absolutely. The federal government, that's one of the things we learned, isn't it, from the Snowden revelations. We do it to our own people. And, uh, and a new class of malicious script kitties. Because there's no benefit to bringing down the internet. That's kind of back on the, you know, the vandalism scale. Malicious script kitties who go, you know. We've learned, uh, for instance, there's a company. There was a company that uh, would do this for you know as little as 30 bucks a month subscription fee you could bring any site down they ran a whole bunch of uh, what they call botnets and you could hire them and it was cheap which meant that any you know kid who had a you know didn't like school or didn't like a company could just bring it to its knees it's a it's a terrifying thought and i i don't know what the solution is we've i think the companies that make the operating systems microsoft Apple, Google have done a pretty good job, the best job they can anyway, of securing their devices. But there's so many other things, so many other devices out there who have not, that have not been properly secured. Like, for instance, these cameras and routers made by a company in China, Shang Mai, that really didn't put any security into them at all. They've since, you know, updated the firmware and asked to recall the hardware but the problem is they can't update the hardware remotely so you have to pack your camera up send it back to china not going to happen there's still going to be millions of devices out there that that are just waiting to be hacked and exploited it makes me sad because the promise of the internet was so incredible but uh, so utopian 
And most people do use it that way. And it has changed the world in so many good ways. And it just takes a few rotten apples to ruin it for the rest of us. I'm, I'm sorry. That's I shouldn't bring you down like that. Think of all the good things that the Internet does, right? Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? Maybe, maybe poor timing for this. Uh, for the first time, iOS and Macintosh have had a serious uh, vulnerability, exploit. Now, a lot of times I think people who run Macs, and certainly iPhones, feel like we're, we're safe. We don't have to worry. The bad guys are going to go after Windows. They're going to all go after Android. We don't have to worry. Uh, a little, yeah, maybe this is a little uh, a wake-up call here. There is, it was actually a very similar vulnerability to Android's, what they called stage fright vulnerability. It was possible. Now it's fixed, by the way, because the company that discovered this did the right thing. They told Apple before they publicized it that Cisco was the company that found it. They, they unveiled a vulnerability that was very similar to one last year that was called the worst Android vulnerability ever. And I'm sure a few iPhone and Macintosh users going, <laughs> well, you know, I'm, don't be too quick to laugh at these things because what goes around comes around. Similar thing, a, a, a malcrafted iMessage could be sent, would work either, as I said, on the, the desktop or on your portable that would allow a bad guy to take over your phone, to get hold of your password and files just by sending you a message. Just by sending you a text message. Now, as far as we know, it's good that Cisco found this. No one has used it. It wasn't, a, it wasn't out there in the wild. Cisco told Apple. Apple has released a patch. But what it, what it underscores, and I think the good news is Apple users pretty much always do this, is you've got to apply those fixes. So, And by the way, this isn't just Macintosh and iOS, iPhone. It's iPad. It's Apple Watch, Watch OS. It's Apple TV, TV OS. Uh, so those have all been patched. El Capitan, iOS 9.3.3, watchOS 2.2.2, tvOS 9.2.2. Um, if you are running OS 10 Mavericks or Yosemite, the earlier version, El Capitan is the current version of OS 10. If you're running last year's version, there isn't a fix yet. Hmm. I'm sure there will be soon. I guess the answer probably is to disable iMessage the Messages app on those desktop computers if you're still running Mavericks or Yosemite until the fix comes out or upgrade. And one good thing Apple does is these updates are all free. You can upgrade to the latest version of OS X uh, for free. Are there, there may be Macs that can't get past Mavericks. You know, they're too old. If that's the case, turn off messages. Turn off messages. And, you know, I want to pat on the back to Cisco. Uh, because they told Apple first and they let Apple fix it before they told the world. And I'm glad they did both. They should tell the world. We should know, right? And it's a call to all of us. If you haven't updated your iOS, you might have noticed a recent update, or your Apple Watch or TV, do that now. Or your Macintosh. And do it whenever there's an update. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. In 1932, at the height of the Great Depression, Bill Halligan, W9AC, age 33, formed a new company. He called his new business the Halicrafters. The name was chosen as a composite of the two words Halligan and Handcrafted. Bill adopted the creed, Handcraft Makes Perfect, and it was used in the first logo of the new enterprise in late 1932. A few radio sets were built, the S1 through the S3, at an old manufacturing plant at 417 North State Street in Chicago. Immediately, the young Halicrafters company was beset with problems. Most of the hams these new radios were designed for hadn't yet recovered from the Great Depression and did not have the money to buy the radios. As of this wasn't enough, RCA came down hard on Halicrafters for patent infringements, insisting that no more radios could be built until they granted Halicrafters a license, which they had no intention of doing. Bill didn't give up. Procuring as many orders for his radios as possible, he contracted with a licensed manufacturer to build them in small production runs of 50 or 100 sets. 
He had to use these orders themselves for collateral, an arrangement that at best was very limiting. What Hallicrafters needed was a license to build under the RCA patents. In 1933, Silver Marshall Incorporated went into bankruptcy, and Bill saw an opportunity to get his coveted license. A deal was engineered. Bill and Hallicrafters took over Silver Marshall Incorporated, renaming it the Silver Marshall Manufacturing Company and operating it from the State Street address. This relationship was also plagued with financial problems and ended in late 1934. Bill was released from his obligations to Silver Marshall with the help of the Echophone Radio Company. Echophone was also in financial trouble for all practical purposes, it was out of business. But they had a 50,000 square foot plant and a good RCA license. Bill struck a deal with the owner of Echophone and the two companies merged with Hallicrafters being the dominant partner. During the first few months, the company did contract work for other radio manufacturers and large mail order houses in order to build its cash reserves. In late 1935, they started producing their own line of communication receivers, which we are all familiar with. The SX-9 Super Skywriter was the first model to be produced in significant quantities. Hallicrafters' policy was to build a quality product with all the state-of-the-art advances and features at a price that was affordable. With this policy and good management, they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. By 1938, Hallicrafters was the most popular manufacturer of communications receivers in the U.S. and was doing business in 89 other countries. Bill decided on another policy, that as new features and technical advances were made, Hallicrafters would bring out new models rather than just upgrade the same basic model. This explains the proliferation of different models which in a three-year period from 1936 through 1938 had reached 23. Until 1938, the production was limited to receivers and associated accessories. Now it was time to produce transmitters. The onslaught of World War II took the U.S. by surprise. There was a shortage of military radio equipment and tremendous government demand for electronic equipment of all types. Many of the existing Hallicrafters products and designs were pressed into military service. The company geared up for wartime production and was responsible for many new designs and innovations. Probably the best known of these were the HT4, the BC610, and the SCR299. Production of ham radio gear and related items was all but suspended until 1945. By August of 1945, the war was over, and so were wartime production and most government contracts. It was time again to produce ham radio equipment. A new line of consumer electronics was needed to satisfy a public hungry for products they had gone without for over five years. The old plant had served Hallicrafters well during the war years, but the company needed a modern image for their facility and product line in the post-war period. A new plant was designed and built at 4401 West 5th Avenue in Chicago. This would be the company's home for the next 20 years. The products were given a modern look with the help of Raymond Lowy, a well-known industrial designer of the time. One of the first post-war sets produced in the new facility was the SX-38. The logo was again changed, this time to the familiar Circle H. Production also began on the new line of consumer electronics, including radio phonograph units of all shapes and sizes, AM-FM receivers, clock radios in brightly colored Bakelite cases, and television receivers, the first of which was the T-54. Many of the consumer products bore the name Echophone, which had all been but forgotten by this time. Competition was stiff in the consumer electronics field, and this Hallicrafters line never really took hold, although it stayed in production until the late 1950s. Even so, the company was doing better than ever, employing 2,500 people by 1952. The 1950s were very successful for the company. 
The United States' focus during the 50s was civil defense, so many Hallicrafters products from this period bore the names like Civic Patrol and Defender. Some of the ham radio products became classics, like the HT-32 and the SX-101. Much of this equipment is still in use today and is sought after by nostalgia buffs and collectors. By 1958, Bill Sr. wanted to retire and the company was sold. Little is known about this transaction, but apparently it failed and the Halligans returned to resume control of the corporation a short time later. In 1963, Hallicrafters purchased Radio Industries Incorporated of Kansas City, running it as a subsidiary. Radio Industries produced many of the ham radio accessories and some major equipment like the HT-45. Also during this period, Hallicrafters was the corporate sponsor of REACT, which was formed in 1962. The Halligans continued operations until about 1966, when the company was sold to the Northrop Corporation. This ended forever the Halligans' involvement in Hallicrafters. Northrop moved the company to a new plant in Rolling Meadows, Illinois, and modified the logo again. While a subsidiary of Northrop, Hallicrafters produced ham radio products for a few more years, but the main function was producing paramilitary equipment in Northrop's Defense Systems Division, much of it in El Paso, Texas. For all practical purposes, the last ham radio item produced was the FPM 300 in 1972 and a few accessories through 1974. There were also some CB units and portable AM-FM shortwave sets of Japanese origin released under the Hallicrafters name. At this point, Northrop turned Hallicrafters over to its partner, Wilcox. The annual sales of Hallicrafters have been falling off sharply since 1970. On December 4, 1975, Wilcox sold the company to the Breaker Corporation of Dallas, Texas. Breaker packed up 14 semi-trailer loads of Hallicrafters records and parts and moved the company to Grand Prairie, Texas. They set up shop there with several former Hallicrafters employees of the late 60s and 70s who relocated to Texas. A few more CBs and various portable radios of Japanese and Taiwanese origin were released, but Breaker began to suffer severe financial difficulties. Around 1979, Breaker ceased doing business and Hallicrafters along with it. On August 24, 1979, Clarence E. Long engineered a purchase of the name, logos, and what was left of the company. A new corporation called Hallicrafters International was set up in Miami. It also had international trademarks. Long set up shop and hired a large staff in anticipation of receiving large government contracts to build paramilitary radios for the armed forces. The new Hallicrafters International had to prove to the government that it could handle the contracts as well as the old firm had. Something went wrong, however. Long's plans failed to be approved and Hallicrafters lost the contracts. In the early 1980s, Long set up a plant somewhere in the New England states and also had convinced several well-known people in other parts of the company to join in the new venture. Despite all this activity, Long was in serious financial and legal trouble. He declared bankruptcy on June 1, 1988 in San Antonio, Texas. All of his property, including the Hallicrafters name, logos, and whatever records were saved, were made property of a court-appointed trustee. Since this time, the Hallicrafters name has not been used and for all practical purposes is non-existent except in the memory of ham radio operators. In our next installment, we will continue looking at fallen flags in the amateur radio field. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, June 15th. A sunspot just crept into view, but not to worry. It's fairly weak and doesn't pose much of a chance for strong solar flares. 
Its appearance, however, has caused the solar flux to rise just into the low 70s, which should give us some openings on 17 and 15 meters. At the same time, our planet has entered a stream of solar particles, but it's a weak stream. We should see few, if any, disruptions on the HF bands over the next several days. On VHF and UHF, 6 meters is still producing fireworks, especially for the FT8 users. Look for daytime openings between late morning and mid to late afternoon. Tropo openings have been popping up on 2 meters and above in Southern California, the Central U.S., and far northern Maine. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. Field day is almost upon us. Will the astronauts on board the ISS be making random contacts on field day? It will be nice if they do. However, keep in mind that operating time other than school contacts are done during the astronauts' time right before they go to bed. Having an astronaut spend hours on the radio during field day would be wonderful, although very expensive for NASA to justify. Therefore, the answer is probably not. Take a listen now and then as the ISS passes over and be ready just in case. Do not forget everyone is gearing up for the ARRL field day. If you have someone making your satellite contacts, be sure to include their scores in the AMSAT field day. AMSAT has a shorter window for turning in your score so that we can make it into the next edition of the AMSAT journal. For full information, visit AMSAT.org, click on events and field day. I will be operating the satellites from my local club. Hope to make a contact with you. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. CAMSAT, China's amateur radio satellite organization, has offered additional details about the three amateur radio satellites it plans to launch later this year. Two of the satellites, designated CAS-5A and CAS-6, will carry transponders and one of them will offer HF capability. CAMSAT's Alan Kung BA1DU told ARRL that the 6U CAS5A will carry two HF transponders and two VUHF transponders. The plentiful equipment package includes an HT2129 MHz mode linear transponder, an HU2135 MHz mode linear transponder, an HFCW telemetry beacon, a VU linear transponder, a VU FM transponder, a UHF CW telemetry beacon, and UHF AX25 4.8K 9.6K baud GMSK telemetry. The HT mode linear transponder will have a 30 kHz wide uplink centered on 21.400 MHz and a downlink centered on 29.490 MHz. RF output is 0.5 watts. An HFCW telemetry beacon will transmit on 29.465 MHz with 0.1 watt. The HU mode linear transponder will have a 15 kHz wide uplink centered on 21.435 MHz and a downlink centered on 435.505 MHz. The RF output is 0.5 watts. The VU mode linear transponder will have a 30 kHz wide uplink at 145.820 MHz and a downlink on 435.540 MHz. The RF output is 0.5 watts. The VU mode FM transponder will uplink at 145.925 MHz and downlink at 435.600 MHz. The transponder passband is 15 kHz and the RF output is 0.5 watts. The UHF CW telemetry beacon will transmit on 435.570 MHz with an RF output of 0.1 watt. The UHF AX25 4.8K 9.6K baud GMSK telemetry will transmit on 435.650 MHz at 0.5 watts. Kung told ARL that the HF, VHF, and UHF antennas are quarter-wave monopoles. A satellite within a satellite, the tiny CAS-5B, weighing 0.5 kilogram, will be deployed from CAS-5A in orbit. 
It will carry a UHF CW beacon on an amateur radio frequency. Both CAS5A and CAS5B will be placed into a 539 by 533 kilometer, 97.5 degree orbits. They will launch from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in late September. The 50 kilogram CAS6 microsat will include a VHF CW telemetry beacon, a VU mode 20 kHz linear amateur radio transponder, and AX25 4.8K baud GMSK telemetry. It will also carry an atmospheric wind detector and other systems that will operate on non amateur frequencies. A launch at sea on an as-yet undetermined date is planned for CAS-6 from the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. The microsat will be placed into a 579 by 579 kilometer, 45 degree orbit. So what tools should I bring is a question I often find myself asking. Unlike changing the oil in the car, I can't always bring all the tools I want to when working on a tower. Lots of folks use a hanging tool bag. I don't use one, so I don't get to carry all my tools. I have to anticipate what I may need to bring along. The job sort of dictates what tools I'll need. I often wear a light windbreaker with two large zipper pockets on the front, and that's where most of my tools and supplies ride during the climb. The basics I usually carry on first-time installations are pliers, vice grips, wrenches in standard sizes, one locking razor blade knife, two small variable wrenches, one multi-purpose belt-mounted hand tool that includes screwdrivers, cutters, and a knife. I also bring several rolls of coax seal and electrical tape. Some extra stuff I always bring are a AA battery-powered HT and an earbud speaker. I bring two loop-type canvas climbing straps, extra carabiners, a camera with film and battery. I photograph my work for the customers. Many of them seem to really like that. When working on an installation I'm not very familiar with, I use extra straps and safety gear just in case. If the tower you're climbing on has a steel safety cable, but your ascender is made for ropes, the ascender will slip down or not lock with downward pressure. Always be sure to bring extra carabiners if for nothing more than to secure each ascender where you climb to so they don't slowly, silently sneak downwards. There are two basic types of applications for ascenders. For climbing with a steel safety cable, the regular rope type ascender won't latch properly. Climbing with a steel safety cable ascender on a rope, the rope could get damaged by the tough clamping action of the steel cable type ascender. Always be sure you are using the proper type of ascender before climbing. An ascender is a device which is slipped over a rope or cable and is connected to a climbing belt. As the climber goes higher, the ascender slides up the cable but if pulled downwards, it grips tightly and holds in place. Many commercial towers have safety cables. Before you use a safety cable, check it and be sure it's in good condition. When climbing down on the same ascender, you must grab its handle and lift upwards to release the catch and then push the ascender down as far as you can reach, then climb down to it. An additional safety device you could use would be a carabiner from your harness to the safety cable in case you unknowingly became unattached from the ascender. I hear from lots of people about a fear of climbing. I always tell them the same thing. After you get above the treetops, you lose the sense of gaining altitude. Just like riding in a commercial airliner, if the plane gained or lost altitude, maybe a couple thousand feet, you would have no way to tell just by looking at the ground. The same thing is true for tower climbing. The change in the way things look is so gradual, it's hard to tell you're getting higher from the air. I'm always too busy paying attention to what I'm doing and how I feel. I seldom pay attention to the scenery until I get to where I need to go. It's difficult to look straight down since the tower blocks most of your view. It's easy not to ever see the ground directly below you. I think a healthy respect for heights can help keep you from taking unnecessary chances with safety gear too. So don't let a little fear stop you from taking care of your own tower work. What you should be afraid of is climbing without the proper safety gear and training. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net.
No doubt most of you have heard of AMSAT over the years, but likewise most of you are unaware of what AMSAT has been doing recently. Here are two brief excerpts from the AMSAT forum held last month during the 2018 Dayton Hamvention. The first voice you'll hear is Joe Spire, K6WAO, who has been president of AMSAT since October 2017. Here's what we're going to cover, AMSAT highlights. We'll cover what we've done, what we're going to do, where we're going, and some possible changes. Here is our new board of directors. You can see that uh, Granbury, Texas and Houston area is becoming the center of the AMSAT world there. These three uh, directors are up for re-election or new directors, so if you feel like becoming a board of directors member, get online, get your uh, nominations in and uh, you too can gather the big bucks that are made in satellites. We are an all-volunteer organization and will gladly double the wages anybody else gets except for Martha. <laughs> this is our officers. We have uh, an executive VP in case I get hit by a truck now. We have two openings, user services. So if you're a web-based folk and you like to deal with all things HTML and have joy in stores and that kind of stuff, come talk to me. I want your services. If you've got marketing experience, we need to chat. Down again, you can see Clayton and Granberry, and we have uh, Keith up in Ontario. So we're well represented across North America. I have a new vice president for education. Alan Johnson is uh, right here. He started yesterday, so he's not quite up to speed yet, but he'll get there. We have a new Hamvention Operations, Phil Smith, this first year. He's done a great job. Then the rest of the cast of characters. And Chuck Ladowick is our new Eris International Delegate from O Canada. So to summarize, this is what we do. Keep amateur radio in space. Here's our accomplishments last year. Launched uh, Fox 1B is now AO91. Launched one cliff will go up sometime this, no earlier than this summer. 1D is now AO92 in a polar orbit out of uh, India. And uh, 1E is uh, under development for the Alana 20 program. Again, scheduled to go up on a uh, Virgin Galactic Pegasus rocket probably at the end of the year. Phase four, come talk to me about phase four if you need to. We've had some movement on it, but those missions are likely going to be on hold. We're working with camera partnerships for uh, Fox uh, 1C and AO92, Vanderbilt, Iowa, Ragnarok. These are all of our partnerships that we've developed for the Fox series. And some of these are going to translate into the golf series. Those will be Ragnarok and Albuquerque Public Schools and some VT and Vanderbilt University programs. We're going to be higher up in the radiation belt, so we want to study more radiation. And we're also operating FalconSat. That is a store and forward satellite at 30 degrees above and below equatorial uh, degrees. So FalconSat is store and forward, and it's operating on the amateur frequencies now. Uh, you can go use an old WISP program for that one. So uh, Fox program materials are in the public domain. Eris, Frank will talk about that. AMSAT Journal, we're keeping it on time. Had some new leadership changes. Me, Barry, is the uh, IPP now, the immediate past president. New EVT, new secretary. And we have some openings, user services. So that opening for Veep, I'm lobbying hard. Our membership trends, they're slightly up. They uh, are continuing on an upward slope. It seems like if you launch satellites, they will come. So the more satellites they, uh, we launch, the more members we seem to attract. So if you're not a member, I ask, why not? Success breeds success. So that's what we're taking out of this. It costs real dollars to have operations in space. So we uh, look for ways to encourage donations. We want to find it the easiest way possible to accept your contributions, which are tax deductible, of course. So we're doing multi-year fundraising efforts, doing a lot of different partnerships, a lot of sort of in-kind donations from vendors and suppliers to be able to get the stuff we need to keep us in space. To quote uh, Tom Wolf in the movie The Right Stuff, what makes your birds go up? Funding, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. And Tom passed away the 14th here of the month here, so that quote cannot be more appropriate. So our fundraising efforts are go to the general fund, they go to launch funds, go to Eris to help Eris out, 
and uh, go to our golf tee missions. So our expectations, we expect uh, Fox 1 Cliff to be launched. We expect Fox 1E to be launched on Alana 20, golf tee. Uh, greater orbit, larger footprint is the name for that one. So 3U, more space, more space in space to do more things. So our CubeSat licensing, we're working on that. We're working with the league for comments on the FCC's Part 25 Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Don't worry, it should not affect amateur radio. It is about commercial space opportunity. But we want to protect the amateur radio spectrum, so that's where our comments will come in with that. So a lot of confusion because it says CubeSat or it says satellite, but it does not affect Part 97 and we're trying to keep it from affecting part 97. So we have Eris going on. Eris has to raise considerable amount of funds, another $150,000 to get the multi-voltage power supply launched, and Frank will speak a lot about that. So our content management, AMSAT Journal, our website, we're always looking for content and for fill for that. So if you write articles, you've never written an article, try. It becomes easy after a while and get out there on what you're doing on the satellites, how you're operating, and write stories for the journal, write stories for the uh, content for the web. So we're looking for social media, and we're probably going to take that social media and get a consultant to do it because, hey, I'm an engineer, I'm an amateur radio operator, I'm not a marketing or social media person, so maybe I ought to outsource that to somebody who knows how to do it a whole lot better than me. So there will be some of the changes you'll see in the way that AMSAT shows its presence out in the community. Field operations, we have taken the area coordinators, and from the area coordinators we have developed what is AMSAT ambassador. It's kind of the same thing, except if you bring the area coordinators, they were regionally based. So somebody owned Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Somebody owned the Pacific Northwest. Somebody owned Colorado. We're making it virtual. There's a number of AMSAT ambassadors out there. They can get together with people by email, by Skype, by using modern communications, electronic means, and we share the wealth all over the country so we get people's questions answered faster. So we're rebuilding uh, AMSAT ambassadors. Here's my big announcement for Hamvention. Symposium, 36th annual AMSAT space symposium and general meeting will be in Huntsville, Alabama at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center the first weekend in November. You can make your hotel reservations at the Marriott right next door and the uh, banquet will be under the Saturn V rocket this year. So come down and see us in Huntsville. It, the symposium itself is at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, and we're working on some tours for that, like a tour of uh, Marshall Space Flight Center or Redstone Arsenal. We've already got the background tours in for the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, so if you're interested in space, come see us. How can the members help? We found the best recruiting is you, our members. So talk AMSAT up and get people to join AMSAT. If you let your membership lapse, get it back up. Uh, Martha's working on the database to make sure that your number never goes away. So we can dig you up and find you in the database unless you're prior to the implementation of DBase 3 in 1982. Then you're just, I'm sorry, out of luck. Donate to our launch campaigns. Uh, use the satellites. Talk up the satellites. The ARRL is grid contest going on. So uh, try that one. Write articles for the journal and volunteer. That's what AMSAT is all about, is volunteering. AO91, uh, Rad Effect SAT, you will hear the train noise from the telemetry because it's data under voice. So we've had some people say, what is all that train noise on the audio? Well, that's the data. That's the data under voice coming down. AO92 has an L-band downshifter. That's the difference. It also has a camera. There's the techs, uh, the experiments with the gyros, with Penn State, with Virginia Tech with the camera, and with the University of Iowa, the High Energy Radiation CubeSat instrument, or Herky, which is also the nickname of the uh, mascot for University of Iowa. Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, the international chairman of the ARIS Committee, as well as Vice President of Human Space Flights for AMSAT North America. For those that don't know, this is, you are here. We're in two locations right now, a space station in the Columbus module 
and in the uh, Russian service module. I think most of you know that. That's where our ham stations are located. We got VHF and UHF in the service module and VHF right now operational in, in the uh, Columbus module. We have slow scan and ham TV. I want to convey in this chart is how comprehensive our program is right now. It's the most challenging we've ever had. It's fun, but it, uh, we're doing a lot of things. And I'm going to talk about a lot of these things. The one thing I'm not going to talk a lot about is a space agency collaboration, which is important for AMSAT and ARIS's future. If you know what's going on in human spaceflight, there's all this talk about going to Mars and now to the moon, depending on who you're talking to. But internationally, there's plans to go into Deep Space Gateway, which is between the moon and the Earth in that area as a, as a way of uh, being able to gateway stuff from there to the moon or to Mars or whatever. We've been working both on the European side and on the U.S. side with the, our space agencies to make sure they understand that uh, amateur radio has done these kinds of things before in space, has done it all the way out to receiving Voyager uh, signals, receiving Cassini signals. And so the, we can do this stuff. And so we put in a request for information that came out of ESA. Uh, on the ESA side, our Eris Europe team, and on the U.S. side, we've had several conversations with uh, NASA on the Deep Space Gateway. The next couple charts are a shout out to our sponsors, CASIS and SCAN, the uh, NASA Space Communications Navigation Organization, provide the funding that supports our operations. That's $150,000 a year that they're providing to us. And then, of course, the amateur radio leadership uh, from this organization, AMSAT North America and ARL, two tremendous partners for our support. And then the next chart actually shows some of our other major sponsors, uh, Kenwood, over the years and continues to be a major sponsor. Dara, of course, and QCWA, Joe Lynch, and yes, Chet Latowick, VE3, Charlie Fox uh, Kilo is our new ARIS delegate, our AMSAT North America delegate for Canada. And we're looking forward to uh, working with him on our endeavors. Our next ARIS International meeting is going to be in the uh, U.S. It'll be in the Washington, D.C. area, College Park, Maryland. We've got a lot of different things going on. We're going to have a two-day education summit. It's a U.S.-based activity. We're going to have some NASA tours in the afternoon of Tuesday. Of course, three-day ARIS International meeting on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then Saturday, October 20th, we will have our hardware development discussions. We can have dedicated discussions there. So this is an opportunity to meet the uh, international team and learn more about ARIS and actually have fun. I also wanted to talk about the fact that since uh, we talked last, uh, we've established an education committee. We have an operations committee that's been going on since the beginning. We have 22 U.S. team members uh, that are educators or informal education individuals that are supporting this. They're supporting the proposal process for the contacts. They're supporting us in booths all over the United States that we're doing for CASIS and for SCAN. And they're interested in mentoring our educators, basically mentoring the teachers that are going along and helping with lesson plans. Bottom line is we're trying to make our program even more comprehensive in an education perspective. Some of our operational accomplishments include the fact that we touched last year about 170,000 people. Just think about that. Both students as well as the general public, and this is direct touch from the perspective of they were in the rooms when we were doing these things. Indirect means that they're might be in a, a classroom as compared to in the auditorium when these things are happening. Girl Scouts of America are just uh, three of the many contacts. We did uh, 81 contacts last year, and we're approaching 1,200 contacts since we started in December 2000. ARL sponsored the development of a pre-contact video to get the students and the general audience aware of amateur radio in a more in-depth way and what's going to happen before the contact. So we wanted to make that similar from contact to contact. So where are we with the onboard status? From the service module perspective, we're pretty much where we were last year. The radio, the D710 that's on there is a stock radio, has really no frequencies in it, if you will. So we're just operating it in a kind of a, I'll call it a kludge mode, if you will. It's not the way we want to operate. But it is a powerful unit, and you all know that because you can really hear it uh, beam down. Things that have changed, I know everybody knows we are down with digital right now, and that doesn't mean we don't like digital. It's just died out, so we aren't doing APRS. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the interoperable radio system. We had a little bit of a design changes going on with the interoperable radio system. 
we thought we were going to launch by October. We're probably going to launch in January, February timeframe at this point. What that meant is we had a little downtime and we decided to work with NASA and fly one of our flight backup packet modules and Lou, myself, and a few others, Kenneth Ransom, spend the time to get that certified flown. Expectation is we're going to have all the paperwork done before July and it'll fly in early October on either Soyuz or Progress. And if we can get on another earlier flight, uh, they'll put us on it. That's what they told us. We're trying to get that up and operational again as quick as possible. Uh, you probably saw a, t a press release from us about the uh, ham TV system. We're having uh, the transmissions have been out for several weeks. We've been doing a lot of troubleshooting with the astronauts. We've got a couple more things going on. We've got to go through these beforehand. Unfortunately, when ESA built the ham TV system, they did not build a flight backup. So we have to bring it down, repair it, and bring it back up. That's something that we're working pretty aggressively on. And there's a little bit of a thing we're working relative to making sure that ESA is totally on board on this because this is really their hardware and we're the custodian of it. So we're working with them on that to expedite this. I wanted to say a little bit more about ham TV and that's that we will get this back in operation as soon as we can. One of the biggest stumbling blocks we've had is a down converter and the availability of down converters. Our Towsley has been working with our international team and Lou on the development of this little device. Basically, it's a $75 device that you can hook up to a dish antenna, pointed dish antenna, and basically with a piece of software then receive the ham TV system. And so I wanted to make sure you all were aware this is very recent. There's some other uh, units going to be coming out also in Europe, but this is the United States version of it. You can start working on that. Hopefully by then we'll have the ham TV back up and operational. We'd like to get lots of stations up because then we can chain them together, get lots of signals. So let's talk about the new, the next generation system, and that's the interoperable radio system. Our reality is that we're going to improve our downlink capabilities through a higher power D710GA radio system with a uh, power supply that can support VHF, UHF, voice and packet, and, uh, and then the slow scan television. We started this program 21 years ago. Bill Tynan, myself, Lou McFadden, and Rosalie White, three of the four at the first meeting. We're a solid program within NASA, within all of the space agencies that are running uh, International Space Station. And it's the teamwork that's made it happen. And uh, we want to go beyond low Earth orbit. We have this opportunity on Deep Space Gateway. The voice of Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, the international chair of the ARIS Committee, as well as Vice President of Human Space Flights for AMSAT North America. Up next, we'll get the lowdown on AMSAT's Fox CubeSats from Jerry Buxton, N0JY, Vice President of Engineering for AMSAT North America. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The Fox 1 CubeSat had great success with them. We have three of them in orbit right now. Fox 1A, the first one built as AO85, that was launched in October 2015. Fox 1B, AO91, went up in November of last year, and Fox 1D, Delta, went January of this year. Fox 1 Cliff is pending launch later this year, so is Fox 1E. Fox 1 Cliff will go on a, a space flight launch, an SSOA mission that they have. Fox 1E is Radifex Sat 2, and it's uh, got a linear transponder versus the others, and it will fly on the Virgin Orbit. They renamed themselves sometime this fall. I can't disclose it, and they're really not quite that settled this yet, but it should be before the end of the year. The first four of them had single channel uh, FM transponders. If you're familiar with them, if you worked them, AO85 started out a little bit hard of hearing. It was difficult to work at our target of a five watts and an narrow antenna, essentially as an easy sat. I have explained that in various places. If you uh, aren't familiar with that and are curious, I do have a YouTube video, the good and the bad of AO91, I believe is what I called it, uh, that touches on that based on uh, the results we saw with AO91. Three of the four, yeah, have uh, an AFC built into the receiver. With the UHF uplink, the uh, generally five kilohertz steps that you get on an HT, the Doppler on 70 centimeters is plus or minus 9 kilohertz during the pass. The AFC was formulated in order to help. AFC, as you may know, it locks on to your signal. It does lock on to the strongest signal, so you've got to be the top dog in the pile up there, if you will, to actually capture it. But it helped. It was provided as a little assist for the Doppler tuning. We disabled it on Fox 1 Cliff because before we had determined 
what the cause of FOX 1A's problem was, we weren't sure if the AFC might not have been part of it. So with FOX 1 C and D pending an earlier launch at that time, we disabled on cliff, left it on D so that we could make an observation to determine whether or not that was it. Of course, their launches got postponed and uh, we figured out what was wrong before they ever went up. But when you work them, FOX 1 cliff will require a little bit more attention to the, to the Doppler tuning. Both C and D have the L-band downshifter and what that does is it provides uh, the opportunity for an L-band or 1.2 gigahertz uplink, again on FM. The sensitivity of that is great, as well as the 70 centimeter receiver on B and D right now. The L-band uplink, some HTs have L-band. It provides a great opportunity to signal to get into some microwave work. And it, essentially what it does is it receives a 1.2 gigahertz, converts it down to the 70 centimeter input frequency and passes it on into the existing receiver there. Of course, we got the uh, telemetry simultaneous with those train, which I can't figure out, have them work for the railroad, how that sounds like a train, but uh, the train sound that you hear, the rumble, not all radios catch it, but below the voice. Fox 1E being not originally planned, the Fox 1 was supposed to be four CubeSats. We had leftover parts, if you will. I kind of tossed out the challenge also with some nudging from people like our vice president of operations to go with a uh, transponder. So Fox 1E is kind of an experiment in itself to fly a transponder. So it will have a 30 kilohertz transponder. We turned it around with VHF uplink and UHF downlink, and uh, we expect uh, that that will provide up to maybe 10 SSB QSOs at a time, depending on how friendly you are with your signal. So that, that'll give us a little bit of transponder activity in LEO. It will also have a separate telemetry channel. The downlink will be 1200 BPSK on a separate frequency. So it's not embedded below the uh, transponder itself. And uh, you, you got the whole transponder to yourself for the communications. So overall, as, as a look back so far, we're three for three. We've lived up to the EasySat claim, despite AO85 being a little bit hard of hearing. It can be worked you know, five, with five watts in an arrow. It was and continues to be. Uh, of course, when you get a bunch of people vying for it, then, then that tends to lose out because it does require a little bit more signal. You can work any of uh, 91, 92, and therefore I expect uh, whatever uh, Fox 1 Cliff will be called with a handheld and a quarter wave antenna. We did, we found that in testing an aftermarket quarter wave on the UHF. It was solid signal in and out. So they're very sensitive. The change, the fix we made to the Fox 1 uh, to allow for what happened to the Fox 1 antenna. Fox 1A just uh, took care of the receiver sensitivity problem. And we also found that on L-band, it is just as sensitive. I had originally advertised 100 watts ERP as a suggestion for L-band before we flew it because we weren't certain. We have found that Paul Stetzer, I believe he has a 1 watt HT uh, that does 1.2 gigahertz and his uh, Iowa Yagi that he uses, Iowa Arrow, I think. And uh, he gets into that just fine. So he's, I'm thinking, pushing about 10 watts ERP out of that. So it works very well. We've uh, seen a lot of new people trying out the satellites. The nice thing about the Foxes and the reason they're designed the way they are as an easy sat is to give new hams an opportunity. If you have your technician license, you probably have an HT. And uh, even with a simple antenna, you can build, you can try it out and see if you like satellites. And if that works good for you, then there are other exciting things to do in the satellite world as well. Cheap test drive. I have been producing some videos and streaming some videos. Some of you may have seen them on YouTube and then I moved over to Twitch for the, the live streaming because from my perception as the VPE, you know, we say we're gonna build a satellite or something and then things kind of disappear for about four years and we come back with a satellite. So everybody wonders what's going on. Believe me, there's a lot of work going on to get something that's space worthy that is going to be a high guarantee of success in, in our terms and last a long time. It takes a lot of work. So some of that, which in the beginning, I had a bit of the Fox 1 engineering model that I had videoed. And now here at the end, it's mostly testing of the flight models. And I stream that from what I call Fox Labs, which is my workshop uh, in Granbury. They can be long videos, but if you want to tune in and find out a little bit about what it's really like, you can speed it up, you can skip through it. A two hour video is just a, a kind of a slice of one test that we have to do. So it gives you an idea of what we do. I also produced now and then a maybe 15 minute video to talk about certain things. I did one called Rat Effect Sat Tour, I believe, describing a bit about the foxes in general and Rat Effect Sat as I had the flight model in hand and uh, the 
uh, Good and the Bad with AO91 that I mentioned, which talks about some of the trials and tribulations that even though we've built essentially five identical Fox satellites in a sense, every one of them has its own string of problems. They are very complicated and uh, they are very fitful and will drive you nuts right to the ends. So the voice of Jerry Buxton, N0JY, Vice President of Engineering for AMSAT North America, from the AMSAT Forum held at the 2018 Dayton Hamvention in May. To read more about AMSAT, go to amsat.org. That's A-M-S-A-T dot O-R-G. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio. We, as radio amateurs, log things. We log our contacts, we log our progress towards an award, we log how many different countries we've contacted, which stations we heard with Whisper, how many kilometres we managed per watt, which stations were in a net, what call signs received a QSL card, what location we are in when we made a contact. You get the point. We log things, many things, and for many different reasons. Here's a log I started last week. An asset log. You heard me. An asset log. A thing that logs what amateur radio stuff I have when it came into my life, where it came from, what brand it is, what model, what the serial number is, and if I spent money on it, how much money I spent. It shows things that I've loaned to other amateurs, and it shows things that are on loan to me. It started with a conversation about a silent key. That's what we call radio amateurs who have died. The idea of a silent key is one that reminds us that everyone is unique, that every manual Morse code transmission has a particular feel, and that this is unique to every amateur. Once that particular combination of speed, tone and pacing is no longer heard, they're said to have become a silent key. I've been an amateur for a few years now, and in that time I've seen the process that happens once an amateur becomes silent play out over and over again. In my experience it's not pretty. It almost always appears to end in something akin to a feeding frenzy, where the person who got in first grabs the best stuff and leaves the rest for the next person. Rinse and repeat until there's nothing of value left. It leaves me with a bad taste in many ways. For one, the family who is left behind might not know or understand that there is a monetary value associated with what's often referred to as grandpa's gear, and they might just be in need of some extra financial support in their time of mourning. Another aspect, if there is no actual need for money, is that the person whose shack is being dismantled might have an idea on how they would like to see their hard work live on. They might want to donate it to a particular person, an organisation, a club, a school, or some other destination of their choosing. All that can only work if there is a list of stuff. Having a family member construct that list is going to be a tough ask, unless you're fortunate enough to have more than one amateur in your household. Asking another amateur to make the list creates a load of work with, at best, guesses of age and value. The only person really qualified to make the list about your shack is you. Last week I started the list on a spreadsheet that I'll share with my family. I'll add to it when more stuff arrives, and if I feel the need, I can remove stuff that has moved on. I'm not in the position to add new amateur equipment to my shack more than a few times a year, so maintaining this list isn't going to be an onerous task and I could imagine that the list expands to include tracking which equipment went with me on a field day, which I have to tell you is always a challenge to track. As a bonus, the list can be used in the case of loss or theft, and for insurance purposes, so it's not just for when the time comes that we become a silent key. To get started, make a list of what you can see around you and keep adding stuff. If you keep accounting records, they can be used as a source of information too. We log lots of stuff, and I think that adding an asset log is something that will add to any amateur shack, and it could form the basis of a legacy that you might leave behind. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. A Washington, D.C.-based broadcast journalist and radio amateur, whose ability to speak was severely impaired a couple of years ago by a rare disorder, is adopting a technological solution to return his voice to the airwaves. AWRL member Jamie Dupree, NS3T, suffers from a tongue protrusion dystonia, and he has limited speaking ability. He uses the barrel of a pen in his mouth to help better control his tongue. 
He had to drop off the broadcast airwaves and turn to print and online journalism to continue covering politics for Cox Media Group's Capitol Bureau. But now Dupree plans to leverage technology that will give him a fresh new voice. Dupree, 54, a contester and Potomac Valley Radio Club member, said in a blog post this week his plight attracted the attention of his colleagues at Cox Media, who mounted an effort at the company's Atlanta headquarters to find a high-tech solution to get him back on the broadcast airwaves. What they found was a Scottish company named Sarah Proc, who agreed to sift through years of his archived audio and build up a voice. The big news today is that it looks like it's going to work, said Dupree, and allow me to talk on the radio again. He's calling it ITV Jamie Dupree 2.0. Does the voice sound perfect? No, but it does sound like me, Dupree continued. When I type out some words, the text-to-speech program that I use spits them out in my new Jamie Dupree 2.0 voice. Dupree concedes that the voice will sound robotic to some of his listeners, but for the first time in two years, I'll be back on the radio. Dupree said the plan is for him to once again feed news stories to Cox Media Group's news talk radio stations, putting him back on the air in hourly newscasts, reporting the news from Capitol Hill and Washington, D.C. Jamie Dupree 2.0 is here, and I couldn't be more excited about that, he said. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, or ARISS, has announced that five schools and two organizations have advanced to the next stage of planning to host amateur radio contacts with the ISS in the first half of next year. A review team of teachers from the ARISS U.S. Education Committee selected proposals moving the process into Phase 2. ARISS's primary goal is to engage people in science, technology, engineering, and math activities and involve them in pursuits related to space exploration, amateur radio, communications, and associated areas of study and career options, the ARISS announcement said. The schools and organizations are Faith Christian Academy, Orlando, Florida, Hidden Oaks Middle School, Prior Lake, Minnesota, Huntington High School, Huntington, Texas, Moriah Central School, Port Henry, New York, NIH National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences Children's Inn, Bethesda, Maryland, Park County Public Library with Boys and Girls Club of the High Rockies, Fair Play, Colorado, and Pembroke Junior Senior High School, Corfu, New York. ARISS anticipates that NASA will be able to provide scheduling opportunities for these U.S. host organizations. The candidates must now complete an equipment plan that demonstrates the ability to carry out the ham radio contact. Once equipment plans have been approved by the ARISS technical team, finalists will be scheduled as their availability and flexibility match up with the scheduling opportunities. With the help of amateur radio club volunteers, ARISS coordination, ISS crew members speak directly via amateur radio with audiences in a variety of public forums such as school assemblies, science centers and museums, scout gatherings, and space camps. ARISS is a cooperative venture of the ARRL, AMSAT, and NASA in the U.S. and other international space agencies and amateur radio organizations. Sweden's World Heritage Grimmiton radio station SAQ Alexanderson Alternator will be on the air July 1st on 17.2 kilohertz for its annual Alexanderson Day transmission. Three transmissions are scheduled. Startup and tuning at 0815 UTC, message transmission at 0845, startup tuning at 1015 UTC, message transmission at 1045, and startup and tuning at 1215 UTC. Message transmissions continue at 12.45 UTC. All three transmission events will be available via YouTube. Amateur radio station SK6SAQ will be active on CW at 7.035 MHz or 14.035 MHz or single sideband at 3.755 MHz with two operating positions planned. Send reports to SAQ and SK6SAQ via email or the Bureau. The World Heritage Grimmiton radio station site will be open to the public on Alexanderson Day. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Phoenix sailor and radio amateur Timothy Henning, KE7WMZ, has expressed his gratitude to the Maritime Mobile Service Network for intercepting and handling his distress call on 14.300 MHz. 
Net Control Operator Harry Williams, W0LS, caught Henning's call requesting assistance with an urgent medical condition on May 23rd. Henning, some 200 nautical miles south of Ensenada, Mexico, in his sailing vessel Victory Cat, reported that a severe vision problem had developed in his right eye and he was seeking immediate medical attention and advice. Williams contacted the U.S. Coast Guard in Alameda, California, relaying all information concerning the medical problem and staying on the air with KE7WMZ for several hours. The Coast Guard, in turn, relayed the information to the on-duty flight surgeon, who advised that Henning seek immediate medical attention at the closest port of call. It was decided that Henning would continue to Ensenada, and the Coast Guard arranged to have someone meet him there and transport him to the Balboa Naval Hospital in San Diego, while his wife stood by with the vessel at the dock. Ultimately, it was determined that Henning had a detached retina, and he was transported to Phoenix for surgery. The Maritime Mobile Service Network operates daily on 14.300 MHz from 1700 UTC to 0200 UTC. It is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. On May 23rd, the U.S. House version of the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, that included the language of the Amateur Radio Parity Act in Bill H.R. 555 cleared the House. The following day, a fiscal year 2019 Financial Services Appropriations Bill, also containing Parity Act language, cleared the Financial Services and General Government Subcommittee of the House Committee on Appropriations and now is working its way through the full Appropriations Committee. As a result, the Parity Bill has attracted some attention from outside the amateur radio and homeowners association communities. ARRL Hudson Division Director Mike Lysenko, N2YBB, who chairs the ARRL Board's Ad Hoc Legislative Advocacy Committee, called attention to a recent Politico article that addresses the challenges the bill faces. On May 25th, Politico reported, lawmakers are making a multi-pronged push to drive the Bipartisan Amateur Radio Parity Act through Congress and finally bypass objections from top Senate Commerce Committee Democrat Bill Nelson of Florida, whose allegiance to his state's homeowners associations drove his panel to yank the bill from consideration last fall. The legislation, H.R. 555, would direct the FCC to let amateur radio operators get around private rules like those imposed by some HOAs that keep them from putting up radio antennas. Politico cited a spokeswoman for the U.S. House sponsor of the Parity Act, Representative Adam Kinzinger, Republican of Illinois, who told the journal that Kinzinger is hopeful that Senator Nelson will see its value. When disaster strikes and the power goes out, like when Hurricane Irma hit Senator Nelson's home state of Florida back in September, amateur radio operators become critical to emergency response efforts, Kinzinger's spokeswoman said. At this point, it's unclear how the Parity Act language or legislation will fare in the U.S. Senate. The measure's Senate sponsor, Senator Roger Wicker, Republican of Mississippi, told Politico that it would suit him to see the Senate follow the lead of the House in the matter. I think we've done enough that Senator Nelson's concerns should have been answered, Wicker was quoted as saying. Wicker and Nelson are both senior members of the Armed Services Committee, which will oversee the NDAA. ARRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, stressed earlier this month that the Parity Act does entitle each and every amateur radio operator living in a deed-restricted community to erect an effective outdoor antenna. Full stop. That is the principal benefit of this legislation. Imlay pointed out that tens of thousands of ham radio licensees at present cannot erect any outdoor antenna at all. This bill enables them in the same way PRB1 has enabled hams to address unreasonably restrictive zoning ordinances during the past 33 years, Imlay said. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, 
submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.